My name is Rob Bayman from the University of Liverpool, and today I want to talk about the quantification of protein isoforms using q technology. Now, almost by definition, isoforms are very, very similar in protein sequence, and they're not easy to discriminate. You would choose to do this in most instances with mass spectrometry, but mass spectrometry is not inherently a quantitative method unless we introduce standards. And for protein quantification, we would normally elect a peptide or more than one peptide, often triptych, as surrogates, and therefore use them as standards. And one of the nice things about mass spectrometry approaches is because we can make these in a stable isotope, labeled or heavy form, we can use them as internal standards as well. The technology and the approach is very well established and very well understood. You take the protein to be quantified and digest it. You synthesize or somehow prepare a heavy standard peptide in known quantities. You do the mass spectrometry. Because of the stable isotope labeling, you can then discriminate the heavy and the light forms, and the ratio of the two will quantify the unknown light form. When you've got a lot of proteins, you're faced with the challenge of generating large numbers of standards, and you really need to find ways to multiplex this mass spec-based quantification. The approach we take in QConcat technology is, first of all, we select the proteins we want to quantify. We then, in silico, break them into proteolytic fragments, and we do this for all of the proteins. And from those proteolytic fragments, we will elect certain peptides to be used as standards. And so most of the peptides are discarded at this time, we will retain a few. And in QConcat methodology, we then take those peptide sequences and use them to create a template for a synthetic gene. So in other words, we will assemble those peptides into whatever order is appropriate into this synthetic protein, and then we will buy and build a synthetic gene to encode that protein. We express that gene in a bacteria, usually E. coli, and we grow it in media that contains heavy or stable isotope labeled amino acids. We then purify the protein after it's expressed, and we mix it with the analyte proteins and then we digest with proteases. And the nice thing here is because we are assembling peptides on the basis of their proteolytic fragmentation, these are reconstructed and reiterated in the standard. We then do the mass spec and we get the analyte and the standard signal. Now, when you come to the particular proteins we're interested in, which are the proteins of the MUP gene cluster, there are, at the moment, 21 known genes in this region of chromosome 4 in the mouse. And if you look at the aligned protein sequences, it's not difficult to see that they are very, very similar. Those alignments. They're all 162 amino acids long in mature form, and you can see small differences, but by and large, these are highly conserved proteins. And that creates a problem because you have to find individual peptides that are appropriate for each of those individual isoforms. If you look at all possible peptides, then you should be able to work out those which are unique to individual proteins and those which are shared. In this instance, we've had to change the protease from trypsin into endopeptidase lyse C because you generate larger fragments which have a greater chance of capturing the isoform differences. Now, the blue peptides here are those that are unique, and you can see that there are some proteins, extreme left and right, that contain large numbers of unique peptides, but there's an awful lot of proteins in the middle of this set in pink that have shared peptides, and that makes the quantification so much more difficult. However, it is possible to generate one of these q -concats. and here you can see a q -concat. We've got 17 peptides in total mapping to multiple proteins. Remember, of course, that since this is a synthetic gene, it is very easy for us to add things like the purification his tag L1 in this graph. You'll also notice that while some of these peptides map to single proteins, look at L9, for example, mapping to MUP20, that's the protein known as darsin, there are other peptides like L8 that actually give you quantification on three different proteins. And you do have to do a little bit of arithmetic. And if you look at this map, you can see, for instance, that there are some peptides common to many of those proteins, some that are common to only one, and you can see how you might have to build some subtractive arithmetic in order to, order to be able to quantify each of them. The q itself expresses extremely well. After 16 hours induction, we have large quantities of this protein. And remember, it doesn't need to fold because its fate is to be digested. We then take that expressed protein. We will do the co-digest, in this case using a urine sample for the MUP quantification, and do the quantification by selected reaction monitoring. The nice thing about this approach is that if we put in a picomole of the protein, we will, after digestion, have a picomole of each of the peptides. So we don't have to quantify each peptide individually. And the outcome of this is that it becomes feasible to quantify large numbers of proteins that would otherwise be inaccessible. And to illustrate this in this last slide, I'm just showing you the quantification of around about 12 proteins in both female and male inbred mouse strain C57 black. And you can see that we are able to get quantitation, for example, MUP5 at quite low levels, and other proteins, for example, MUP9, at quite high levels.